Okay, here we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXJS Weekly episode 23. Um, it should have been done yesterday, but apparently I'm, I'm an incapable idiot and I forgot to unmute myself while doing a stream. Since no regulars were here watching it, nobody told me that I've been doing an hour of talking to myself essentially and well, I had to scrape it and uh, there we go, it is Sunday, but we're doing episode 23 from uh, yesterday, basically today. So it is not very large. We do have some pretty major releases, actually, some really cool demos and libraries and some silly stuff, but not that many articles, you know. So let's get started and let's get um, through it, I guess, you know. So the first article we got is client-side GraphQL schema resolving and schema stitching. The blog post that talks about the fact that you can actually use GraphQL with the REST APIs or multiple GraphQL APIs and do the schema stitching and resolution on the client, which is something I haven't thought before about. So if you are not familiar with the way GraphQL works, it's basically in addition to the schema that describes the uh, structure of the data, you have the resolvers that actually resolve the specific um, objects or entities, right? And typically this is done within the GraphQL server. So you can see this here on the diagram, you typically have the server that includes the schema and the resolvers and then the client just sends the queries, right? Um, the setup that author proposes, which seems actually a really a uh, straightforward idea, but I never thought about it myself, is that you can actually move the schema and resolvers to the client, thus making the APIs or endpoints or the data can be allowing basically the data to be resolved from just about anything, including like REST APIs or other GraphQL APIs, and then you can like combine it. It's really simple, but really powerful. Um, it, of course, it is not going to replace the GraphQL server, right? Because it basically nullifies the GraphQL benefits like reduced API calls, less data and all that kind of stuff. But this will allow you, for example, to do incremental migration and things like this. So if you're interested to have a look at the article, there is also the link to the source code that basically uh, is a tutorial for this. So if you're interested to have a look. Next article we have is the um, component based web with uh, zuix.js or maybe it's just zuix. I'm not sure how to read it correctly, but uh, let's just go zuix. <laughs> let's, let's call it zuix. So this was submitted by one of the viewers and um, yeah, it's a UI framework, which seems to be pretty nice. Uh, it has all that you would expect from the modern framework. It has code splitting, uh, packaging, whatever you can imagine, everything is here. And uh, it's basically based around using the data attributes on the um, HTML, right? So it's, it's quite simple, right? And yeah, seems to be quite nice. So if you are looking for another UI framework, do have a look at this one. Maybe you will like it. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Um, module loading, code splitting, all of that is here, bundling and whatever you can imagine, right? You know, it's like yeah, lazy loading, templates, theming, whatever. Modern framework, I mean, all of them have those features typically. Okay, next article we got is using composition and render props instead of context API. An article that goes to talk about the problem of passing props to the children components, right? So say this is the structure you have, you have a main component, then the first is nested within it, second is nested within it, and third is nested within the second. So you got like a pretty deep tree and then you need to pass the prop from the top one to the bottom one, right? The typical approach is using the prop drilling, which is I think everyone familiar with you just pass the same prop over and over and over and over again until you get to the very bottom, which works, but is very annoying to do and not very nice, right? So the author goes uh, to see to explore the alternatives uh, to look at how it can use actually composition to replace the prop drilling and actually pass the property directly to the third component and as well how you can use the render props to make it even simpler and why render props is again, you know, very powerful pattern. So if you're, uh, if this is the problem you encountered and you want to know the different approaches to solving it, do have a look at this article, it is quite good. Right, next article we got is micro task and macro task, a hands on approach, a pretty in depth article that goes into um, explanation of how the JavaScript event loop call stack uh, heap and all that kind of basically task queue related things work, right? So you got the, the heap, you got the task queue, you got the event loop, and all that stuff executes your code, right? So this is 
an in-depth look into how exactly all of that works, uh, how exactly you implement the task queue yourself, and how exactly does the code actually is being executed. So in this case, the author gives a couple of examples with uh, quite complex ones as well, like with timeouts and promises, and walks them line by line explaining what exactly happens in terms of, you know, the call stack, the task queue, the event loop and all of that stuff. So if you're interested in uh, the uh, JavaScript engine internals, and if you want to know more about how exactly the task queue and all of that stuff works, then do have a look at this article, it is really good and will give you a very good um, understanding at least on a basic level of how exactly the uh, this stuff works. Okay. Next article we got is improve your motion. Um, it is essentially a collection of pretty neat CSS tricks about transitions and animations for the components. It basically discusses a couple of things that well, I personally know, since this is kind of out of my field of expertise, I wouldn't even think about and uh, talks about what you can do to make your animations look better. For example, the I never thought that uh, change like duration and delay before animation would impact the perception of the animation so much. So there's two examples on the screen right now. On the left, you can see the animation that just have the specific duration. So say we have the objects appear within uh, one second, I guess. And on the right side, you have exactly the same animation that takes exactly one second, but instead it starts after 500 milliseconds and then just has the duration of like a few, like 200 milliseconds or something, right? So it's very quick, but after a delay, it looks so much snappier. I, like, it's just really, really cool. And you know, this is those little things that you have to know to make things look really great. And um, I think it's a pretty neat collection of those tricks. There's a few more in here. So if you're interested to have a look again, this is more of a CSS article. Right, continuing, we got machine learning in Node.js with TensorFlow, um, an article explaining how to set up uh, TensorFlow uh, JS within Node and how to run image recognition and uh, specifically um, image tagging. So in this case, you won't be building your own model, you will actually be using existing mobile net model that uh, includes like 1000 different classes um, that can be identifiable within the image. Uh, it doesn't talk anything about building your own models. Um, I guess this is, you know, out of scope because the tutorial is quite big anyway, but it is quite good. So if you want to know how exactly you um, classify an image using Node.js and TensorFlow, do have a look at here because it includes all that you need. Basically, you uh, take the input image, you convert it to Tensor 3D, and then you create input values for JPEGs. And it, I mean, it is a pretty complex process. So you, you have to know how to do that properly, right? Before you can actually do that. So um, yeah, if you're interested in TensorFlow and uh, image recognition, basically in nodes, have a look at this article. It is a very good starting point, like really in-depth explanation of just about every aspect. Right, next article we got is continuous deployment pipelines and open source Node.js web apps. How to configure a continuous deployment pipeline using now shell GitHub, uh, Travis CI to automate your open source web apps, um, Node.js web apps. So yeah, this is essentially a pretty lengthy tutorial, a very, very, um, the aimed for like a very beginners because it even goes through explain how do you know how to register account at now shell at GitHub, how to push to GitHub and stuff like this on how to set up continuous delivery with Travis and now shell uh, for your node app. So it starts by talking about, hey, okay, we create a basic node app. In this case, it's just an express app that serves a hello world page. Um, and then it goes, okay, now we're going to publish it on GitHub. So if, including, as I said, creating GitHub account, which is kind of funny, I guess, but you know, maybe someone doesn't know about it. So you push it to GitHub, then you set up Travis CI and uh, now shell to where you deploy it um, using Travis, right? So it's really straightforward. There's nothing super complicated about it. But if you've never done this, this is a pretty good starting point to do that. And since this is an auth zero blog, of course, you're going to get additional uh, entry on how you can add auth zero to your express application, because why not? Um, one note, if you are um, using your own servers like I do, for example, and if you don't want to use now shell, you can always switch to exoframe, which is a tool that I created. It's free and open source and I'm doing shameless shilling here. It is really a 
basically very similar to now shell and provides a very simple way to deploy your apps including from the ci systems with tokens um yeah just give it a go all right let's continue uh the next article we got is how we're scaling react native another perspective on react native from a company called ui tv at least i think you read it as ui because it's written as u.i i i guess it's ui tv so they're talking about how they're using React Native uh, to deliver the tools for their clients. So the UITV does the video, um, like serving video as a service. Basically, you can buy the platform from them and create a video based uh, startup or whatever service, I guess, right? So and they provide all the tools around the video serving, which I imagine includes the mobile apps as well. So um, yeah, the Article is essentially sort of a perspective on uh, how they approach the development, what kind of problems and what kind of advantages did they get with uh, React Native, how did they tackle the problems, how did they exactly handle like performance, the uh, version management, the unified design and so on and so forth. So it's pretty interesting to read. So again, you know, if you are still not sure if React Native is your thing, do have a look at this article, maybe it will help you. Okay, continuing, we got squeeze Node.js performance with flame graphs, a pretty in-depth tutorial on how to use flame graphs in Node.js to optimize your application performance. Uh, if you're not familiar, flame graphs is the technique for uh, CPU profiling. So it visualizes the code execution using this sort of uh, yeah, flame graph. Uh, if you've never seen them, just Google for it. If you're listening to this as a podcast, if you're looking, then well, it's on the screen right now. So this is how it looks. Basically, all of this is the function calls, right? So when you generate a flow graph, uh, flame graph, you can actually figure out which of those functions takes longest and we, where you, you need to optimize it. So in this tutorial, authors create a simple um, um, MongoDB and uh, Express app, so the server that just queries that MongoDB and returns the results. They use the Apache benchmark to, high load, to do the high load testing. They start with a 400 request a second, which is, well, not not terrible right but yeah it's uh it's um yeah okay ish so they generate the flame graph and uh see that okay there's a bunch of functions that actually eat up a lot of time so it's like i mean it's like about yeah about 30 percent of time here and um it seems like deserialize object is the problem in this case because the mongodb driver deserializes bson uh, into json and uh, they decided to fix it using the 2RA method, which is the sort of uh, custom uh, deserialization method, right? Um, and uh, in this case, they use the, what was it? I think they use the aggregation. Yeah, so they aggregate it instead of just exporting everything to RA and they gain an increase in 3% of performance, which is kind of superficial, right? But still an increase. So the flame graph helped a bit. Next, they uh, investigate the um, flame graph further and seems like the socket, so the connection is taking a lot of time, right? Which, which is something to be expected, honestly, because it's like, yeah, it's actually quite expensive to query a database. They've adding the cache. So again, you know, if that's something you can do, you should do it anyway. But obviously with the cache, they have like, uh, what was it? 400% increase. So from 400 requests per second to five 5,000 requests per second. But you know, that's because you have everything cached basically. So you're now benchmarking cache. But anyway, if you are never, if you've never used flame graphs, if you never even, if you didn't even know about them, this is a really good introduction to them uh, on a very specific use case, but you know, you can basically adopt it to whatever you're doing. So if you're interested in uh, optimizing node apps, then have a look at this article. It will give you a very good starting point. All right, next thing we got is how to deal with dirty side effects in your pure functional JavaScript. A very, very large and in-depth article on pure functional programming in JavaScript. Um, if you are not familiar with functional programming at all, you will have a bit of a problem reading it because there's a lot of like, there's quite a lot of uh, functional programming um, lex uh, bleh, how do you call it? Uh, language used basically. And there's a lot of like stuff like, you know, functional programming uh, function notations and some concepts that you would only know if you were uh, familiar with functional programming. So, um, if you're interested basically in functional programming, if you already know the basics, this is a really good article to read. Um, 
especially if you want to write pure functional JavaScript, which is, um, I personally found that that's just not for me, that never works for me properly because JavaScript is way more flexible when you can mix and match both, you know, classes with functions. And yeah, it's, I mean, again, it's just my thing. But uh, if you really like pure functional programming, and if you want your JavaScript to be pure and functional and very nice, then well, this article is goes into a very in depth um, exploration, I guess, of what does it mean to be pure functional code and how you can achieve it with JavaScript, even though you have things like, you know, global variables and side effects and uh, stuff like this. So if you're interested do ever read, it is quite good. All right, next article we got is getting Alexa to respond to sign language using your webcam and TensorFlow JS. Another TensorFlow.js article in this case is sort of a use case overview. So the author uh, created the sign interpreter that basically communicated to Alexa and um, answered with on-screen text, which is I think really, really awesome. And all of that is like built on web. So it's basically in a browser, right? And all of the models and uh, they use the, um, now what was the name of it? Wait a second, PoseNet, the TensorFlow.js um, model that basically recognizes the poses. And then they train the KNN classifier um, that basically also is published now. So um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be really straightforward, but the use case is just really awesome. And you know, if you're interested in how exactly it was done, you can read through the article, you will find all of the details right here. I believe there was a code somewhere as well. So it's, uh, it's a really cool case, basically. Yeah, if you're interested in machine learning, do have a look. Right, next thing we got is, um, yeah, this is probably one of my favorite ones, uh, introducing Electron Fiddle. So we had uh, stuff like JS Fiddle, Glitch, Code Pen, Code Sandbox, you name it, for ages, right? You got the very cool code playgrounds that you can just go online and type some JavaScript or React or whatever, and you will get the immediate preview, right? Um, it was it, It's really nice to play around with the uh, new packages and test out things, but um, you could never do that with Electron and until now. So um, the author here created Electron Fiddle and it's, um, it's a desktop app, obviously it's built on Electron itself because I mean, you need Electron to fiddle with it. Uh, but it is essentially an integrated, like all in one uh, thing that allows you to write Electron app, execute it right in place. Uh, it seems to be either using the VS code editor or something very similar to it, or maybe Atom. Uh, it looks very nice. And um, yeah, the cool things is that uh, you can share it to gist. So if you if you know, if you want to, you can just publish it to GitHub gist. Or you can compile and package it into a standalone application for Windows, Linux, or Mac OS just by running one simple command, which is also quite simple. Um, I think this is absolutely awesome. Have yet to try it, but uh, this is definitely something that I will be having a look at because I mean, come on. <laughs> I think the only thing that's missing from it is being online. So they're gonna just open my browser and use it in there. But you know, it's Electron. So I, I don't think that's possible or maybe it is, but uh, it's gonna be a bit tricky. But anyway, as is, even as is, is just a really cool tool. All right, next thing we got is hello WebAssembly. A look at WebAssembly through a fantasy console. So we've been talking about WebAssembly for quite some time and it's, you know, it's a great technology and uh, there is, a lot of use cases for it. There's, by the way, there's a really cool story about it coming later in this podcast, but let's talk about this article. So it goes um, to introduce the WebAssembly from the hello, like hello world uh, package by writing WebAssembly by hand using the VAT format, which is the human readable WebAssembly thing, right? So you literally write this very simple module uh, that just says, hey, okay, hello world, and that's it, right? You compile it to VASM binary, you load it into browser, you allocate the memory yourself and you run it. So if you never used WebAssembly directly, if you use like Rust or Golang or whatever, they always handle those things for you. So you almost never know um, how exactly to properly, how exactly does this work basically, right? So this is a really good introduction to that. And after the intro basic introduction, hello world, the author actually gives a extended example called the fantasy console that goes in to implement a pretty much, you know, advanced module that does some pretty cool things over here. 
and handles the user input and stuff like this. So if you are interested in WebAssembly and want to learn the like very basics of it, want to learn how to read it and how to write it, I guess, uh, from scratch yourself, which uh, I guess, you know, writing is not too useful, uh, but reading it can be immensely helpful. So I would highly recommend uh, at least reading through that article because it does give you a very good basics. Uh, unless you, of course, know that already, then you don't really care. Right, next article we got is 11 painful Git interview cache. <laughs> Let me try that again. 11 painful Git interview questions you will cry on. Um, the topic is very clickbaity, but this is not actually uh, what it is about. I mean, you probably will hear those things on the interview questions, but the thing is that this article actually explains 11 Git concepts that are, well, something that everyone should know, and maybe sometimes you're not completely understand it until you think about it or read it. So this stuff like, you know, what is the fork? What is the branch? What is the pool? What is the fetch? What's the difference between pool and fetch? How do you revert the previous commit? What's the cherry picking and how it works? What is forking workflow and stuff like this? So if you are working with Git, if you are um, learning or trying to learn more of it, if you want to know more advanced concepts, do have a look at this article. It gives you a pretty good explanation of most of them. Yes, um, again, you know, not strictly JavaScript related, but I just thought it's quite a good write up and it will be a um, good thing for people to know because Git is quite good. All right, continuing, we got, yes, this is the WebAssembly story I was talking about. Uh, this is WebAssembly story about WebAssembly usage in the wild. And it's a story from the uh, Fortune 500 insurance company. It's very large, very old and um, works in a very curious way. So basically, as the author here describes, the company, like the insurance companies have those quotes that are filled by the brokers, so the insurance agents, who submit the order. And the way that it works is that to fill the quote, you have the bunch of services that figure out the parts of the quote, right? And then there's a coordinator service that brings all of that together. Um, hey, Grish Rock, welcome to the stream. Uh, right, so you have the coordinator service that brings all of those services together. And um, this coordinator service is very complex or like not very complex, but quite CPU intensive, right? Because it has to figure out like it has the business logic, it has the transformations, it has to figure out which services to call and then combine all of the results. So one of the devs thought, okay, what if we take this coordinator service and instead of running it in our server, we actually compile it to WebAssembly and run it in the broker's browser, right? So you just, you eliminate this need to do heavy computations in your cloud and instead you just do it in the browser because the WebAssembly is enough for it apparently. They implemented it and it actually like, okay, with the fall, they, they also talk, the author also talks about the stuff like, you know, they actually have the fallbacks so of the WebAssembly module breaks, then it actually sends requests to the old broker, which is quite nice. But the thing is that this small change after implemented saved them $1.3 million per year, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, just by compiling essentially a service to WebAssembly. It is, it is insane to see what people already achieve with WebAssembly in some cases, but you know, I mean, again, this is a very niche use case, but it's really cool anyway. So if you wanna see, if you wanna read more details, the link is in a document as usual, do have a look. There's some pretty cool things in there. Okay, continuing, we got introducing NPM init MDX. Uh, so the MDX guys created a new uh, init command that basically allows you to scaffold the uh, MDX backed app. Uh, and by default, that is Next.js, but you can also create like parcel, like zero, webpack, razzle, whatever the hell you want. There's like a bunch of them. If you are not familiar with MDX, it's an extended markdown that supports JS6 in it. So you can literally import um, components and then render them within the markdown. This works amazingly well for documentation or creating rich, apologies, rich uh, pages. For example, um, there was this doc Z project that uses MDX actually, which is really great. So, uh, you know, if you are interested in that, do have a look, it's pretty cool. All right, next thing we got is uh, Twitter not allowing to load this thing. Yeah, so there you go. Um, the next thing is sort of this fun fact that I, I, for some reason, a lot of people don't know about it, but a lot of modern games 
use menus and screens that are built using HTML. And in this case, the effect comes from one of the, I, I think it's one of the developers, uh, designers actually at Electronic Arts. So many of the menus and screens in Battlefield 1 were built using React, which is rendered in-game using Frostbite Game Engine. Um, it is kind of crazy when you think about it, but you know, more and more games actually just take web technologies and embed them to make UIs to allow building UIs faster, nicer, and easier, I guess, right? Because, I mean, game engines are complex as is, and, you know, making nice UIs in them is hard, but making them with React is actually quite simple. So if you ever dreamed about career in uh, game development, well, you know, learn React and you might be able to get a UI developer role, maybe. Because, you know, like um, another good example is PUBG because PUBG's UI is made in the React, or I, I don't know if it's React actually, I know that it's HTML. So the main screen that you see, you can actually find it online and all they do is just open a browser with a transparent background above the 3D render in the main screen, which is also kind of cool. Uh, yeah, there's also YouTube talk about that if you are interested. Right, continuing, we got a small tip that is, Seems obvious right now after I've read it, but before that I was pondering on how the hell do you do that. So actually you can destruct properties from a nested objects and still pull out the nested object itself. So say you have the user object that has account and account object has first name and last name. Typically you would distract account into first name and last name and the account won't be extracted, right? But the thing is that you can provide account as one more, one more time as a separate variable and you would get both account and first name and last name. It seems so obvious right now, but I was always doing it like, you know, in two lines, basically I was extracting account and I was destructing account one more time to get the first name and last name, which was like, Neh. this looks just so much cleaner and nicer, but uh, yeah. Right, next thing we got is um, sort of a meta article that I thought I would talk about anyway, because I find the topic to be quite important. Um, the article is called repeat yourself, do more than one thing and rewrite everything. So the gist of the article is that uh, the advice to not repeat yourself is a terrible advice. And most often than not, it actually will lead to a terrible abstractions and a lot of pain uh, in refactoring and fixing thing and debugging, right? So uh, there is a lot of so thoughts and discussion, like really good ones uh, from the author's side in this article, but I just want to highlight one quote here. Um, you can't really write a reusable abstraction up front. Most successful libraries or frameworks are extracted from a larger working system rather than being created from scratch. If you haven't built something useful with your library yet, it is unlikely anyone else will. So um, I think the most important bit like is the first, Part, you know, you you can't you can't come up with a useful reusable abstraction up front. That's just not how it works. So don't try don't try to write dry code. It is not as helpful as it sounds. Like if you I typically found that if I repeat myself like four or five times, then you already start to see this pattern when okay, I can extract this and then it's gonna be helpful. Because if you repeat like yourself twice or even thrice, maybe, then it might not be even worth abstracting that. It sometimes brings more pain than helpful or like than being helpful. So yes, um, if you are interested in sort of more in-depth look into this topic and more in-depth discussion, then do have a look at this article. It is really, really good. Actually done with the articles, uh, let's go to the releases section. The first one being Babel. So we have Babel version 7.0RC. Um, all code is technical depth. Uh, yes, indeed it is like the less code you write, the better it is, that is true. Um, but then again, you know, repeating yourself is not that bad as well. So it's, it's sort of a bit paradoxical, <laughs> but, but okay. Let's go back to Babel. So we got Babel 7.0 release candidate finally. And uh, actually the link to RC0, but RC1 was already released to small peer dependency issue fix. So use that if you want to. And uh, if we are lucky, we're going to see 7.0 release um, this week or maybe next week. So quite soon, this is quite exciting. So with all the new proposals, new features, new speed, and uh, you know, all the other stuff, really cool. Okay, the next major release of this week we got is V8 version 6.9 uh, with memory savings. So the 
um, insane memory savings to tell like to tell you the truth. So they um, let me just quote this: with embedded built-ins, we've seen a median nine percent reduction of V8 heap size of the top hundred K website on X64. Just think about it: median nine percent reduction just because of the engine update. This is insane. Like it is. 50% save at least 1.2 megabytes, 30% save at least 2.1 megabytes, and 10% save 3.7 megabytes or more. So it's just, you know, update the browser and you get less memory usage. It's, it's crazy. So additional things include WebAssembly new first tier compiler that brings speed ups of more than 10x for complex applications uh, like Google Earth and AutoCAD, which is as well insane. <laughs> faster data view applications uh, or data view operations and faster processing of weak maps during garbage collections and as well some additional V8 uh, changes but I guess you know the top highlights would be memory savings and the new WebAssembly compiler. Okay, next release we got is Vue CLI 3.0, the new command line interface for Vue which includes a bunch of really cool features. Uh, first of all, it's configurable with no need to eject which I think is really cool so you you can just, uh, you know, a lot of tools require you to eject, like React specifically, um, if you want to modify the underlying configs or anything. In this case, you can just rerun the config, I guess, and you will be able to just change it without any need to inject or, you know, uh, modify anything, which is kind of cool. So I think it's similar to the Next.js approach, basically. Uh, you got the extensible plugin system as always plugins are really nice you got a really cool graphical user interface which runs in a browser so no electron required as it said you just run view ui and you get a very fancy looking uh, user interface that basically shows you all the tasks and all the results basically including the sizes and assets and everything you might want to do and it also have included server and uh, whatever you can imagine. So it seems like very nice, you know, if you're using Vue, it's probably really cool for you. If not, then, well, maybe it's a good point to start using Vue. Vue is a very nice framework. Okay, next release we got is Got.js version 9.0. It is um, a HTTP request library for Node.js from Mr. Sindrosaurus. If you've never seen it, it is a really good one. And, you know, uh, Mr. Sindrosaurus is a really good software developer with uh, thousands of awesome Node.js modules and not just Node.js, like NPM modules, let's put it this way. And this one is, yeah, quite a major update for one of his uh, libraries. So this is a set request library and uh, a major change, I guess, is that he dropped the Node 6 because the LTS cycle is coming to an end. Uh, node 8 is now the minimum requirement and additionally removed some dependencies and got just got like two times smaller. Here's a really cool comparison. Got.js uh, 9 is 245 kilobytes and request.js is four megabytes. So yeah, you know why why you should go for uh, smaller modules because I mean, they're more efficient, right? I don't know if you want request, four megabytes is insane. I never even thought about that. Yeah, um, the interesting thing is that he managed to increase uh, decrease the size uh, by 50% from the God V8, but I guess this is because, you know, drop support for Node 6, you no longer need any of the, uh, I guess may maybe use Babel or something for pre-compilation. That's quite a lot of size reduction, actually. It will be interesting to see why, but whatever. It's a really good library. I've used it in a couple of projects, uh, quite recommended. Okay, continuing, we got Preact version 8.3.0. Um, it includes get drive state from props, get snapshot before update, MGS bundle by default, and some fixes and some additional improvements. And uh, even though the Preact is a super tiny library, someone actually managed to find dead code in it, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. The cool thing about this is that basically now the Preact has all the same methods that the React does, at least the public API, and uh, a lot of libraries started working with Preact without any Preact compat packages, right? So you have the React compat package, which you can just include, and then everything will work, including the hidden and like obscure non-default methods in React. Uh, but now it like most of the packages that don't use anything hidden in React actually just work with Preact without any compact package, which is kind of great. So you can just swap React for Preact and there you go. So it's, it's kind of cool. Okay, next thing we got is, well, it's not strictly JavaScript, but you know, since a lot of you guys watching me from Dev2 on Dev2 and uh, I just like this community, I thought I would 
throw it into the releases for sake of it. Dev2 is now open source. Uh, so the whole project is completely open. It is a Rails and Preact app. So you can uh, have a look at it. You can contribute. It is AGPL licensed. Um, and they will license all the libraries that are extracted uh, under MIT, which is really nice. So congrats to Ben on shipping this. This is really cool. Yeah, if you're wondering how the how the app like this is built, then have a look. You know, it's it's kind of kind of awesome. Okay, uh, this is it for releases. Now we're coming to libraries and demos. And the first library, or I guess product more than a library or demo we have, I just thought it's really awesome. This is a CSS grid game that looks bloody amazing. Just look at this. Um, so it basically it teaches you CSS grid by playing the game. You have to divide the grid and uh, either unify or split the critters and, you know, or guide them from one place to another or isolate them from enemies. And uh, full disclosure, it is a paid product, so you actually have to buy it now. But if you were scared of CSS grid and if you want to learn it in a gamey format, this just looks incredible. I mean, look at the quality of this stuff. It's like it's quite literally a game where you have to code a grid just too good i couldn't pass it up sorry okay next thing we got is xterm.js um it's not a new one but i don't think i've covered it yet it is a terminal front-end component uh, that works in the browsers and is used in a bunch of places like for example vs code so if you want to write your own terminal you can just use xcode uh oh, sorry xterm why, why am i saying xcode that is not not the thing xterm um, it is a very, like, I think it's one of the best ones out there and it's quite easy to use. And uh, yeah, I just thought I would highlight that. Right, next thing we got is React icons. This is uh, the library I found in discussion to that Preact release notes that uh, was praised by the uh, Mr. Developer himself, who said that this is a really good library and it now works with Preact without any compat or anything. So it's an SVG icons library that gives you very tiny icons from just about all the popular icon sets like font awesome ion icons material design whatever you can imagine right all of them are here and it also has the context support which uh, allow you to set the theme for icons which is kind of great so if you're looking for a good react icons i should start it by the way um you can have a look at react icons it seems to be really really good all right continuing we got foxer node.js api to control Let's try, let's try that again. Node.js API to control Firefox. So this is essentially Puppeteer, but for Firefox. It uses a built-in Marinette through the remote protocol. It doesn't need any Selenium web driver and it works in a headless mode. And it aims to have compatible API to Puppeteer, or at least somewhat similar, I guess. At this point, it has a very small subset of it, but you can like, you know, make a screenshot, open the browser, navigate the page run selectors uh, and evaluate stuff, screenshots, set content, get title. So yeah, it is very basic right now, but it's really cool to see that there is finally a module like this for Firefox, because I was wondering why the Fire Mozilla guys actually didn't re release something like that themselves, because I mean, Puppeteer is a Chrome product, right? It would be cool to see something like this official, or maybe Mozilla starting to, you know, contribute to this and uh, make it make it basically official, because this is something we definitely need. Okay, uh, next thing we got is WebHint, a hinting engine for the web. So this is actually a rename and re-release of the project. We had this Sonarwell project uh, that I covered quite a long time ago, I think like half a year ago. It's um, sort of website analysis project, essentially like the sort of like Lighthouse where you run it against your website and it tells you what's, what kind of problems do you have or what kind of things you can improve on. And they renamed it from Sonarwell, which was non-descriptive into WebHint, which is way more descriptive. And um, there is now a website, webhint.io. Uh, you can use it to try the online scanner if your website is online, or you can run the command line, which is installable via, via NPM. Uh, and I believe it can be run locally. So you can uh, basically after running, it will tell you, you know, hey, you are lacking compression, you're lacking this, this and that, and you can uh, do this, this and that to improve it actually, which is kind of great. And it's always good to have more tools that uh, sort of do the checks against your website and give you the best practices to follow. 
Okay, next library we got is pts.js. Uh, where is my, oh, I guess I disabled. Yep, as always, come on, uh, there we go. Just look at this. I think first time I found it, I spent like 10 minutes just doing this because this looks amazing. <laughs> so it's a points manipulation library. It seems to be quite complex and has a ton of examples. So if you go into demos, there's like, for example, this circles intersection demo. I, um, yeah, it's like canvas space. There you go, I can do this. Um, I don't know, was there, yeah, okay, this is circle, circle within bounds, there you go, this, it's just so fancy, like, look at those demos, they're just so good, and there's a lot of them, um, it seems to include quite a lot of methods from, like, the, uh, geometry, linear algebra, and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, I guess if you don't want to do all of this yourself or don't want to re-implement those bits in D3.js, for example, then this seems to be a pretty good library. It also has very good documentation. It has physics included. It has uh, just about everything you really would want to have when working with dots, I guess, and or I guess 2D planes, it seems, because it has like vectors and it's insane, basically, yeah. So uh, it seems to be a really cool visualization library. Okay, continuing, we got Kakapo.js. Uh, I hope I'm reading that correctly. Next generation mocking framework in JavaScript. So uh, what it really should have said is the next generation mocking, uh, backend mocking framework for browsers. So the idea is that you can use it to mock the backend within your client side code. Um, it's like, you know, there's this uh, knock.js library, right? Which is the HTTP server mocking for node where you can mock any HTTP requests, which like my one of my favorite libraries is really nice and really easy to use. So uh, Kakapo is basically the same, but for the client side. And um, the problem I have with it is that it actually has a very complex API. And instead of just mocking the requests, you need to essentially write your own server within the client code, which is kind of weird. I mean, at least it just feel, maybe I'm just not seeing some use cases here. I mean, it might be just, you know, my short sightedness, but it just seems weird that you need to set up database, router and server to imitate the backend. Why not just follow the knock uh, and, you know, just answer with data to a specific request? I, again, maybe I'm just not seeing something, but, uh, it seems to be very flexible at least, and you can do just about anything you want with it and um, replicate just about any backend you want. There's some examples here, including the GitHub Explorer. And uh, yeah, it seems quite powerful, but I don't know, um, a bit too complex for my liking, I guess. Okay, next thing we got is Fiora, an interesting chat application powered by Socket.io, Koa, MongoDB and React. Essentially open source chat app that includes a bunch of features, including, you know, groups, private chats, group chats, um, text, pictures, code, whatever the hell you want. There is a public demo available. It is in Chinese though, but you know, you can anyway open it and uh, click around and see how exactly it looks and works. Uh, it looks quite nice actually. It has like emojis and everything and uh, push notifications or whatever you can imagine. All that is open source. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any unit tests, but uh, you know, still a decent code base. Uh, so if you wanted to build your own if, or if you wanna see how it's built, do have a look, it's pretty good. All right, continuing, we got Pretty Error, a module that uh, prettifies the errors that are printed in Node.js. So instead of seeing what you typically see, you will see the nice pretty printed error with the references to the proper files and places where it was triggered from, uh, which is kind of nice. So, you know, if you're having problems reading the errors, have a look at this. It is injectable either by the um, simple function call or by require hook, or you can use it as a, a pretty print uh, sort of um, formatter for console log. So you can actually yeah, just render it and then console log it yourself. All right, uh, next thing we got is Camaro, a utility to transform XML to JSON using uh, bindings to native XML parser, Pug IX XM, Pug, Pugi XML, I don't know, is it Pug I XML, Pugi XML? Not sure. So basically it uses the native XML parser and transform XML to JSON uh, using the bindings that you define. It is, as you might imagine, really fast, but on the other hand, you know, it just does one thing, uh, transform it using templates. So it is quite straightforward. 
On the other hand, if you're doing a lot of these transformations, then this is, might be the library for you. Okay, next thing we got is Super Slide JS, a flexible, smooth GPU accelerated sliding menu for your next progressive web app. Exactly what you would expect. It's a sliding menu that, I mean, it looks quite nice. It has a bunch of animations. It's, um, there's an image that doesn't load for whatever reason. Come on, there we go. Uh, so yeah, it's a toast menu um, that can be dragged and it's very simple, but you know, quite nice. Um, two kilobytes zipped. So yeah, if you're looking for something like this, do have a look at this one. Okay, next thing we got is backyourstack.com. It's a website that allows you to check the open source projects that your organization depends most on and that needs financial support. So for example, if we click on Facebook, you're gonna see that Facebook uses Babel a lot, Jest, Symfony, Cheerio, Cucumber, and Electron, and Gulp. And we can see that, okay, Babel needs funding, Electron needs funding, uh, Jest needs funding, and uh, they fund, for example, Babel, they fund Jest, which is kind of amusing because Jest is their own tool, but uh, hey, you know. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So, you know, if you're working in a company and you have open source software and you depend on open source projects a lot, um, and if you can, um, how do you say, convince your management to fund those projects, that will be really awesome. So do have a look at this tool. Right, last thing we got in the demos today is again, not, not really JavaScript thing, but I just thought it was really cool. It's called lazy git and it's a simple terminal UI for git commands. Uh, it basically allows you to do everything you want in git in one uh, nice UI. It's built in Golang, so it runs in every platform and uh, just looks pretty nice. Like you can do just about everything here, including conflict resolution using UI, which is always very nice. Although I, I think I, I'm too used to doing that in VS Code now because it has really good UI for that. But you know, if you're a com command line person, then this is probably uh, something you would like a lot more. And uh, yeah, since it's Golang, it's um, <laughs> very, very fast. Right, um, now we come to the silly part. Uh, the first thing I wanna highlight is XKCD voting software comic, talking and mocking the experts in software engineering field for whatever reason, everyone listens to, you know, the airplane safety, elevator safety experts are reasonable people where computer engineers, software engineers, uh, security experts are terrified of computer voting and uh, yeah, it is, it is very valid mocking. <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the whole situation with the US voting thing is a bit weird, but you would never know until they start. And on the other hand, there was a tweet recently that showed off how to hack the hardware voting machine that is used in the US right now in under two minutes without any special tools. You literally just unplug the card reader from there and you get root access. That's all you have to do, really. It's like you need a you need a ball pen to open it, that's it. And I don't know if that's safer than online voting. So I kind of think that this comic hits uh, pretty hard. <laughs> All right, next thing we got is um, this computer science paper. So like this is a research paper, a proper one. Um, let me just read the tweet summary. Computer science researcher, we need to figure out ways to write safer code with fewer bugs so it can be exploded less often. Who at all? What if takes a huge bong rip? We added more bugs to the system instead. Um, it is a paper. Let me just read you the abstract. Like this, <laughs> this is just great. So it is a paper. Uh, first of all, the name Chaff Bugs, deterring attackers by making software buggier. It's a paper that suggests that you can um, make software harder to crack by introducing artificial chaff bugs that will confuse the attacker and make them waste time on you know, trying to exploit bugs that are inherently unexploitable and um, essentially bollocks, right? So you artificially add more bugs to software, uh, bugs that won't be found by the average users that will make it harder for crackers to crack your software. <laughs> when you think about it, this is insane, but uh, it is a really good paper. So if you are interested in um, reading computer science papers at all, like it's not very hard to read, like it has a you know decently uh, simple language. It is very computer sciencey, so um, expect to be you know to sort of you will need a bit of time to read through it. But it is it is a good one. It's just like the whole the idea of chunk bugs is just <laughs> it's really like it's really cool. Let me just put it this way. Okay. 
And two more things I have. So the first one being the beginning of the end of VPA2. Cracking VPA2 is just gonna hold it easier. If you didn't know, uh, Wi-Fi protection is basically roasted. It's been roasted for quite some time. So VEP is something that you can crack with any laptop with um, air crack installed in about 10 minutes. It's really easy. And if you still use VEP on your router, you should really switch. Uh, VPA was a bit harder to crack up until now. So someone come up with a really simple method to do it with a $10 tra uh, Wi-Fi transceiver. That, that's, that's all you need. You just need a transceiver. Then you fake some stuff and you collect handshakes and then you can just um, brute force it. it. It's it's half an hour now. That's it. So VPA2 is useless, essentially, right? So if anyone wants to crack you, you're basically done. VPA3 is coming soon, but uh, I think it can't come soon enough, basically, at this point. Um, the terrifying thing is that uh, Germany just finally passed the verdict in the law case that basically said that if you are the owner of wi-fi network you cannot be you can no longer be liable for people pirating through it so before they had this thing that you know if you if someone cracked your network and used it to download torrents then you will be the one who was fined which was absolutely insane well this is likely no longer the case and uh yeah just in time i guess for vpa <laughs> getting cracked completely all right and last thing we got, which is even more terrifying, is called Rosenbridge, a new hardware backdoor in some x86 CPUs. This is this is insane. So basically, uh, it's a hardware backdoor called Rosenbridge that allows uh, Ring 3, so user land code, to circumvent processor protections and freely read and write Ring 0, so kernel data. Which means that by, uh, like typically this backdoor is disabled and requires the ring zero execution to enable it. But researchers found that it is enabled by default on some systems. So basically by running this simple uh, binary, right? So you have this demo here in, in GIF size. Uh, you have the, who am I? Okay, so you're just a user. You compile this uh, C file into the binary, you run this binary and all of a sudden you are root now you don't even need to like you don't don't you don't need privileges you don't need anything you just it, it's a goat mode exploit as they call it and it's literally a goat mode you know you just run it and you are root without you just escalate the privileges like immediately the good thing is that it's disabled in most of the systems the bad thing is that of course it's enabled in some of them uh, but there is a fix so since you need to enable it by executing some ring zero code, which means you can execute the other ring zero code to disable it. And uh, the authors provide the um, code to do that. So there is the uh, make file in the fix folder. If you are worried about the, your system being vulnerable, do have a look and uh, run the fix on it. After you reboot, it should no longer be vulnerable. Right, uh, that's basically it from my side. Do you guys in chat have any um, links that I might have missed? Any things that you want to discuss? Uh, hopefully this time around I did not mute my microphone and talk to myself for one hour and wondered why nobody was talking in chat. That was a terrible experience. I turned off the stream yesterday and then I went to check the recording to export it to YouTube and everything. I was like, did I just talk for one hour to myself? I was like, oh my God, it was, it was too painful. Okay, um, right, so it doesn't seem like chat has anything uh, that I might have missed or any other additional things. So I guess we could, um, yeah, I guess we can stop the stream here. We can do a short break and then I would play a while true uh, while True Learn, a game that I was sent that basically aims to teach programming. I'm always really curious about this. So let's do a 10 minutes break and see, see, check, check out the, the game, I guess, right? If you're watching this as a recording, the recording of the game stream will also be on YouTube uh, if you're interested. Um, thank you, Clue Train. I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. We're doing this weekly. So um, yeah, subscribe to if you like more. Right, uh, yeah, let let me just end this stream here and export this to YouTube, Dev2 and all the other podcast places. Thank you for watching, guys. Have an uh, awesome rest of this Sunday and stick around if you want to see me play some programming video games. Bye.